In this lecture, I would like to discuss the effect of time varying loading on the dynamic response of multi degree of freedom systems. On the right hand side, now instead of zero, we have a vector P of t. This vector P of t represents the external loads that act on the structure at every degree of freedom. So P of t is a vector with n rows and one column. Every row corresponds to a load at the corresponding degree of freedom. To analyze this problem using modal analysis, we do our conventional modal coordinate transformation. We substitute in for x double dot, x dot, and x, and then we pre-multiply by phi transpose. all terms in the equation and as we know from prior lectures this term here since the modes are mass normalized is equal to the identity this term right here if the damping is classical is going to be equal to 2 omega psi and this term right here is going to be equal to omega square. And so each one of these terms we can see right here. This is 1. This is 2 omega psi. And this is omega square. Now the term on the right hand side is what we call the modal loading. So it's basically the projection of the load vector into every mode coordinate. And so then that's when you get phi i transpose times p. Once you solve this equation using any suitable method that we have learned to solve single degree of freedom systems, we need to solve this equation n times for every mode. Once we solve that equation, for every mode, we recombine them again by scaling them by each specific mode shape, and their sum gives us the total dynamic response of the structure. And basically, that's all there is in terms of analyzing structures subject to dynamic loading using modal analysis. There are a couple of details, and I would like to just illustrate them here. So let's suppose we have a three degree of freedom structure subject to a time varying load f of t. So f of t is a time history. It gives us the value of that load applied at that location at every time. And if we take that loading and apply it at degree of freedom 3, then what we get as a load vector is what I am um, showing right here. We have 0 in degree of freedom 1, 0 in degree of freedom 2, and 1 in degree of freedom 3 multiplied by the time history f of t. So basically this vector right here gives you the spatial distribution of the load, right? So this is a spatial distribution vector, right? It tells you where the load, the time history is applied. If you have a, the same system but it's subject to two different loads, we can simply superimpose their effects and so in this case we have uh, g of t acting in degree of freedom 1 and we have f of t acting in degree of freedom 3. If we combine these two columns we get a matrix and then a load vector as shown here on the right. And you can generalize this for any case. Now there is one particular case that is of interest to structural engineers is the earthquake loading case. So in earthquake loading case we basically have this equation here and as you'll notice the acceleration term 
is different because the inertial forces are uh, a product of the total acceleration, not the relative acceleration. While the other terms in the equation, x dot and x, refer to relative velocity and relative displacement, the term that goes with the inertial force refers to total acceleration. Similarly, the equation that we have presented is the one that's right here in blue. And so we have to find a way to turn our earthquake case into something that looks like this. Well, the way to do that is by basically writing the total acceleration, the absolute acceleration, as a sum of the relative acceleration with respect to the ground plus the ground acceleration. And if we do that, we can simply bring the ground acceleration part to the right-hand side of the equation and we obtain this term right here, minus r times m times xg double dot, xg being the ground acceleration. M is the mass matrix and R is what we call an influence vector. It's basically what it means is how do the degrees of freedom of the structure move when you apply a unit displacement to the part of the structure that is being moved by the ground motion. So if you have a vertical structure like the one I'm showing here, uh, that influence vector is simply 1, 1, 1, 1, right? So in this case, R would simply be 1, 1, 1, 1. Because when we move the ground one unit, all the masses move one unit exactly. And so it means that the influence, the influence of the ground acceleration on each degree of freedom is is simply additive and it's the same for every degree of freedom. That doesn't mean that each degree of freedom has the same total, uh, the same relative acceleration. It just means that the part that has to do with the ground acceleration adds to every degree of freedom the same way. But this doesn't always happen in every case. Suppose we have a, a beam here fixed at both ends and we have two different support motion happenings happening at the two ends. In one case we call it xg double dot one for the left and xg double dot two for the right. In this case when we move the left one unit each degree of freedom moves slightly different based on the deformed shape that the beam would take under a unit displacement of the left support. If you remember from structural analysis, this is the Mueller-Breslau principle. This basically is the influence line of the left reaction. The same thing can be done for the right reaction, xg2 double dot, and you obtain the influence coefficients and then the total load vector is simply what is highlighted here in blue is the sum of the two effects. The left reaction xg1 double dot and the right reaction xg2 double dot and they can be different, they can be different ground motions uh, and, and then they would affect the structure in this way. This happens often when you're doing a seismic analysis of a long bridge where you could have the two supports of the bridge move different because they're spaced far enough apart. It also happens in pipelines and in other similar structures. So this is a very important case to understand. This can be generalized to basically any situation. Once you realize that these R vectors are nothing more than the influence lines of each support acting separately.